Thanks, everybody. We have a full room again. It's excellent, excellent to get the turnout. So this is the second uh, lecture for the DHPC pilot rating exam. And this one is about flight theory. Uh, what you have on the screen is just a, a rough bullet list of the kind of things that you need to know in order to pass the uh, flight theory exam. And we're going to go through all of these tonight. So the atmosphere, the thing, the thing we fly through. Um, the important thing to, to know about the atmosphere is it's a great big body of air. And air, like anything, it's it's compressible. So there's a lot more at the bottom than there is at the top. Okay. And it's divided into some uh, sections. So the bit that we live in is called the troposphere. And although it's not 80% of the height of the, the atmosphere, it holds about 80% of the air in the atmosphere because it basically just sort of squeezes down. To give you a rough idea, and I've just put some rough numbers on, it's about 10 kilometers high. It's a little bit higher than the troposphere. And then you have the boundary layer, which is what we fly in, which is an area of this towards the bottom. And that's where most of our weather is as well. So above that, you've got stratosphere, shooting stars and mesosphere. You've got the space station way up in the thermosphere. And above that, we're on the edge of space. OK, so we're walking around here on the ground. So there's quite a lot of air above us. Now, if you were to weigh it, so if you you know, if you took a, a column of air that wide and weighed it on right up, it would be, oops, sorry. This is to give you a rough idea. This is the uh, pressure gradient. So pressure, if you think of pressure as being this axis here, it's quite high down low. And then it moves up in a sort of reverse uh, logarithmic line. So it, it, it's quite, uh, the thing to notice here is, it's quite consistent within the troposphere, especially in the area that we fly. And that's relevant for working out things like your DL, your uh, dry adiabatic lapse rate and stuff like that. And um, things so like troposphere, 80% of air, is that by weight? Yes. And by volume as well. Uh, or not, no, by weight. Yeah, by weight. By molecule count. Um, so if you notice that there's quite a linear line here in, in your pressure gradient, which means we can make calculations based on pressure. Yeah. And that's why our altimeters and variometers and everything work on pressure, because it's quite linear. So we can say if the pressure drops X number of um, pascals or megapascals or maybe whatever, we have gone up or down X number of meters. It gets a little bit trickier when you get high, because as you can see, it's not consistent. So it's not as easy to use the pressure to decide what height you're at, your, your calculations get a little bit Your, your yeah. altimeter won't be yeah. so accurate if you go above Everest. <laughs> yeah, so, so right. jet airplanes and stuff need to use um, more complex uh, calculations. But for instance, for us, we have a simple enough one, which is, what, 30 feet for... And that's and that's pretty much up to as high as where we're going to fly. Yes. You know, you can just assume that it's a nice linear decrease in pressure. So, and that's great for us. That's really handy for us because we don't have to be mathematicians to work out things like how high we are based on pressure. Thanks for that. So, how about the weight? So there's roughly a ton of air sitting in your shoulders. So you're, you're carrying a ton. And when you move around, you're carrying a ton of air on your shoulders. Pretty strong. Yes. So how come we don't get crushed? Mm. It's spread all around us. It is. Mm. Plus, you have to keep in mind your body is mostly water. Yes. And water is really good at just resisting that pressure. Mm. So although it is spread all around you, it's still squeezing into you from all around. It's not like yes. just because it's squeezing in here and squeezing in here, your body goes, well, that's fine. It isn't. Your body is squeezing back at the same pressure yes. because it's made of water. Um, and then the things like your air cavity, so your nostrils, your lungs and stuff, well, they don't get crushed yes. because you're generally breathing air at the point that you're actually standing on the ground. It becomes a problem for, we'd say, a diver. If you, we'd say a free, um, a free diver, somebody who takes a breath of air on the surface and then dives down as deep as you can go, 
Well, they're obviously breathing air at the surface at, you know, the surface pressure. Now, when they go down into water, the pressure of the water increases dramatically faster than just the air. So if they go down 10 meters, they're already at uh, one, uh, one bar more than the pressure that was on the surface. Every 10 meters of water is one bar. Um, so a really good free hole diver, free back diver, if they go down, say, 30, 40, 50 meters, their lungs <laughs> are like two little wallets. Not that small, but they get completely compressed because the air inside their lungs is not at the same pressure as the water that's outside. And it does, it actually gets squeezed. And it becomes a limit to how, how far you can dive, deep dive on um, holding your breath. Because you'll actually do yourself damage. You know? Similarly, your nostrils, your eardrums, all of those things. Uh, it doesn't happen to scuba divers, because scuba divers breathe air at the same pressure as the water around them. But there's a, a, an inverse problem with a scuba diver. A scuba diver goes down 30 meters and takes a big breath of air out of their tank and holds their breath. And then they decide to wander up to the surface. The air in their lungs will expand three times its volume and burst their lungs. You need to be really careful when you're scuba diving that you don't hold your breath as you're ascending. Yes. Because you'll, yes. the air will basically, because it's, you've, you've um, the air you breathe it is at 30 meters of yes. water, which is a three bar. Yes. And if you slowly go up into the surface, yes. suddenly you're at one bar, yes. and the air will just expand like this, and your lungs don't get that big. Yes. So they will actually burst out of your chest. So in, in the water, you're talking about pressure in bars, and in the atmosphere, you're talking about pressure in millibars. And the reason is because bars. pressure drops a lot slower. So it's in a thousand millibars to a bar. bar. Yeah. Yeah. So 10 meters of water is one bar. Yes. Yes. You know, thousand, whereas what? 3,000 feet is one bar. Yes. 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 Can we interject an amazing but macabre fact? Yeah. What I learned yesterday maybe today. Mm -hmm. Wind turbines kill birds by impact. Wind turbines kill bats by exploding their lungs. Because the bats know that the wind turbine is there in the dark. Uh -huh. They can echolocate it. They miss it. They go into the air that the turbine leaves behind. Oh into wow! This low pressure zone. Yeah. The turbulence from the blade having passed by. And the pressure in their lungs. And that that overpressures their lungs. Wow. And they just like a scuba diver holding their breath. Then. Just like that. Wow, that's nuts. That is nuts. All that. <clears throat> so that's the atmosphere. The thing to keep in mind is we live right down here, and we fly in quite a low layer. In the heat cave, you're talking about three, four, five thousand feet, you know, and um, not ten thousand meters. So we're only flying the bit we fly is the boundary layer, which is just down here, way down here. Right. So, for doing this here, who knows? Hi, if you, you were at the lecture last <laughs> year. <laughs> you know, Bernoulli's theorem. So, Bernoulli's theorem says that as you squeeze air through. Um, a constriction, or as, a, as a, you push a fluid, and air is a fluid, through a narrowing, the air speeds up, the fluid speeds up, and the pressure within that area drops. So what you'll find is if you put a pressure gauge here and some kind of um, speed gauge, you'll find that the air, this is air you're pushing through here. The air is moving faster here than here, but the pressure is less than here. Higher pressure here is lower pressure here. Now, you want to, that has a number of practical um, applications for us when we fly. And one of them would be, if you're flying a hill here, and there's this gap, you'd say you're flying this front of the hill, the wind's coming along the hill, you're flying along here, and there's a gap, and you're flying again. Well, if you can notice the gap, generally there'll be a restriction. So what's going to happen? The wind is going to speed up as it goes through the gap. Yes. So if you're not careful and you wander along here and you wander in here, you might find that all of a sudden you're pinned and you're pushed through the gap and it can get then you get all the turbulence in the back of the So that's for newly theorem in practice. Yes. So that's why if you were flying a hill like this and it's quite strong wind, you tend to fly here and then you might do nice little 
semicircular to keep itself on the corona to not be pushed back into the constriction. <clears throat> so there's another place that uh, that happens for us. For instance, here you find a hill. There's a hill. You take off here, nice wind, and you find that you go up to the top, and all of a sudden you've been pushed over the back. That's very windy again. Mm -hmm. And it becomes even more pronounced if you have an inversion that's sitting on the top here. Because the inversion is like, um, like a, another wall and it squeezes the air. Or even a cloud, even a, you know, a heavy cloud of the hill will also create a sort of a, a layer that, that squeezes the, the wind. So that's Bernoulli in action. So Bernoulli's theorem. <clears throat> Increase in airflow causes a decrease in pressure. So, aspect ratio. I guess everybody knows what aspect ratio is. It's the ratio of the length of the cord to the length of the span of your ring. The span divided by the curve. Yep. Yep. So, and we see aspect ratios of most, we'd say, in fees and stuff are between 5 to 5.5, which are saying that the span is roughly five, five and a half times longer than the cord. This is in what way? Uh, uh, generally, generally, most of the, we'd say, mid beads would be over, maybe around five, maybe up to 5.5. Some of the high beads are around 5 by 5. Some of them are getting up over six now. And then as you go up into the C's and the D's and into the competition wings and the Xenos, they're going up to seven. No, there's nothing up at the eight, is there? Uh, experimental, yeah. So we, we have things like the baby HP. All oh, right, right. But not, not um, proper, like, successful. Or there's, all up at high seven. can really use. So, yeah. you know, en Enzo's and mm -hmm. Boomer's. They're in the sevens. They're in, they're in the high sevens. <clears throat> And the reason that you find more performant wings are higher aspect is because it has a benefit to drag. Um, a wider wing with a shorter cord has less drag, naturally has less drag. It reduces the, the amount of mostly induced drag. So it's more performant, but it's a bigger handful. Any questions on aspect ratio? So for instance, these would be, Maybe five to one aspect ratio would be maybe a low B. And then you get into seven to one, you're getting into D's and competition. And um, literally, they have similar shape, it's just that they're more stretched. Mm. Less depth in the book. Well, they are because they're wider, right? But with, with the modern high aspect ratio wings, which, especially these two liners and with all the lines and stuff. I, the, the one I flew anyhow, and I flew it on a nice day, it felt really solid, really, really solid. Um, and I think they're, they're, they are more solid. And um, we'd say some of the lower aspect pressure wings, but when they go, they go big, but they don't collapse as quickly, especially with the, um, that that was my experience of it, which is yeah, I agree. It was accepted. I was going, wow, this is amazing. It turned into sixpence. It felt really solid, really pressurized. Like this thing will never go. That's solid. It does feel like you're all right. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, yeah. As a flyer though, which which is preferable uh, if you've got uh, a wing that is a bit more prone to collapse, uh, as, as opposed to one that. Uh, Will not collapse, but then when it collapses, it's a really that's going to be personal really, preference. Really big. That's that's so, a personal thing. Yes. When you decide there's so many variables that you have to kind of balance, and it's it's your compromise. Where where do you want to sit in the whole yes. you know area space of, of wing variables, aspect ratio versus etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So yes. um, there isn't any right answer or wrong answer. Collapsing <laughs> has always been quite a, had a good side to it. In that it is damping pitch energy. So as you glide as pitching, if it's starting to collapse and that's coming back, 
Okay, so you're getting more drag with that collapse. Mm. That, that pitch energy, that shoot is damped. Mm. So uh, in having a glider that's able to collapse, particularly when we're a pendulum under it, yes. mm. that's, that's actually... A good thing. Yeah, it's a design feature. It is, yeah, it is. Yeah. It, it, it seems odd, but it is. It bleeds yeah. excess energy that if, if it didn't collapse, yeah. it'd probably break or it'd invert. Yes. You know, my rigid wing, like hand gliders, yeah. they break yeah. sometimes, yeah. or you end up upside down. Very hard to end up upside, yeah. upside down in a power glider because it'll have collapsed long before that generally yeah. and then popped out again. Um, so, yeah, the, the fact that power gliders collapse is not a bad thing. It's that we can't, that we don't know how to deal with the collapse becomes the bad thing. Mm. But not that they collapse. It's, it's actually, they're designed to collapse. It's designed into the, the glider. Okay, <clears throat> so are we okay with um, high uh, aspect ratio? It's pretty straightforward, really. Okay, so let's talk about, and this is the one, the mechanics of it. Why does Sorry, power glider? Aspect Sorry. ratio? Sorry, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> when you said, um, Got less drag. Mm. Uh, is that induced or perhaps it's drag? Induced. Because now they, they'll also, especially two liners, they'll have less parasitic drag yeah. because they're less line. Less force. You know? Yeah. Um, and they're they're highly optimized. But the, rest of the, wing is on the, tips of that. the advantage of this shape being wider is there's less induced drag, yeah. and the induced drag is a smaller part of the drag that's been created by the wing. Because the wing is wider, so it has less of an impact. It's less, it's less significant. Whereas this induced drag is huge. It's smaller wing, and it also plays a more significant role in your um, uh, gliders. Gliders are very wide wings. So the wider the wing, it's the fact is it has less induced drag. That is just uh, aerodynamics, you know. And that's why uh, more performant wings are usually higher aspect. Well, they always are higher aspect. <clears throat> so, mechanics of lift. Why does an aerofoil shape fly? In this particular shape, the reason it flies is as you go through the air, this shape causes the air to split. Part of the air flows over the wing, and part of the air flows under the wing. And for reasons that I've never really understood, <clears throat> the air that starts to go over this wing, you can see it has furthered the travel over this wing to get from here to, to the end where it wants to meet up with its mates again. And we don't need to worry. This air here actually travels less. There's a little bit more distance for it to travel here. And for some reason, it speeds up. It kind of, it's like, I want to get to the end with my mates. So I want to meet my friend here at the end. So I'm going to go faster over the top. Now, what does Bernoulli's law say about uh, when a fluid speeds up? Low the pressure. pressure drops. So what you have is you have the air over the top of the wing, which is which is recorded. In fact, it does speed up because it speeds up. There's less pressure at the top. So and the air that's flowing under the wing, as you can see, there was this body of air here, and it's kind of squeezed down into a narrower section here. And that causes just here at the front, it causes an increase in pressure. <clears throat> it doesn't speed up because it doesn't generally have to go much faster. It's, it's got less distance to travel. But there is a, an increase of pressure underneath and a decrease in pressure on top. So what's happening? Your airfoil is just going to move up. And strangely enough, you get more lift from the top than the bottom. Intuitively, you think that the lift is coming from the bottom, it's the air pushing the wing underneath. It's not. It's actually the fact that the, there's a lower pressure in the top that it's sucking the wing up in a sense. So that's roughly a third from below and two thirds from above. You need to know that. In the exam, you'll probably ask that. Any questions on that? That's how lift is created. Magic. Magic. So. Let's talk about the forces that are at play when you're flying. So there's three main forces. There's lift, drag, and gravity. 
So if, if you think of us flying through the air, generally when a wing is flying through the air, it's not flying level, it's actually flying, it's always sinking through the air. We're gliders. The gliders are always sinking through the air. If you're good, you'll find uh, a block of air that's rising fast and sinking. So you'll actually have a net gain and you'll, you'll be on it. But you're always sinking through the air. So you're always traveling in a slight direction down to the air. Um, you can think of your lift as being at 90 degrees to the angle of your direction of travel. So that's the lift that your wing is generating that we just talked about, roughly at 90 degrees. Your drag is what's pulling you back when we talk about what's causing drag, but anything moving through the air creates drag. And depending on its shape and you know, the material it's made out of and other factors, that drag may be more or less. And it's one of the big design factors that um, um, people who design paraglides and stuff, they're always trying to reduce drag. <clears throat> So drag is always working against your direction of travel. It's pulling you back, it's pulling you back. That's, that's why it's called drag. If it was working in your direction of travel, it wouldn't be called drag, it's called thrust. So drag. And then the last one obviously is gravity, which is always straight down to the center of the earth. So those are the three forces that work on a paraglider. Now a paramotor would have one extra force, which is thrust. Which is in the direction of travel, <clears throat> generally, unless unless you're an idiot and you turn sideways or something. <laughs> but generally, thrust is in the direction of travel. Um, so the way it, it works is you have this resultant this, when you add your lift and your drag factors together. The way you add a factor together is you just you keep the square, so you go up there, up there, down here, and then you, that's the diagonal, and that's your result. So that is what you're getting. You get so much lift and you have so much drag, and what you end up getting is this force here, which is opposite to gravity. Now it's generally never the same as gravity. In fact, it never is the same as gravity because we're all the time sinking. It's always a little less. Um, because we can't generate enough of lift without an engine to be able to actually counteract gravity. We're always sinking. So our resultant is always less than gravity. The only reason we go up is because we find a body of air that's going up faster than we're seeing. Right? So we're kind of piggybacking on another force, which is the force of that whole mass of air that's going up. But from the point of view of just the glider, it's always seen. So those are the three um, forces, the three forces on a power glider is lift, drag, and gravity, or your weight. And they, they are always working together in some sort of relationship. If you were flying level in still air, neither accelerating nor decelerating, your resultant in your gravity are exactly the same. Right? But as we know, if a, if a power glider is flying in still air, it is never flying level. It's always sinking off at its flight angle. So the glide ratio or the lift to drag ratio. Which is something you might be asked for. The lift to drag ratio is the ratio between lift and drag. And the glide angle is the ratio of how much forward with say meters you cover for how much vertical loss or gain, but generally loss. And they're the same, they work out the same. The relationship between your lift and your drag is the same as the relationship with of how much forward direction of travel you're going and how much work to lots you have in that time. Yeah. You're saying <clears throat> so uh, LD ratio is the same as your glide ratio. They work out the same. Yes. Other previous two wings. Yeah, yeah. Different wings will have different yes. glide ratio. So my wing, I guess, is about a nine in still air. Um, the really good wings, the competition wings would be up at quite 11 now, Pete. Would it be even more? 11 to 1? Yes. You know, A's will probably be an eight. Um, a parachute swing would probably be about a three. Three to one. So they they don't uh, they they drop a lot for for some uh, And what you generally want is you want a higher um, glide ratio or you want a higher lift drag ratio because that means you can travel further before you land. And there's some exercises later on in showing the difference between your 
the higher and the lower blind ratios. I'm sure how it works. Are there any questions about that? Oh. Central pressure. You will be asked about that. What is the central pressure? You just need to. You just need to learn the. Um, uh, you won't have to write it down. So if you're asked what is the central pressure, generally what it means, what it is, is they give you three or four answers and you pick yes. the right one. So just remember that it's it's a point. It's a virtual point or a magical point where you can think of all the forces acting. Now, obviously, all the forces aren't acting through things. They're acting all over the place yes. on the wing. Yes. But you can conceptually think of them as acting through a single point. Yes. And that's yes. the central pressure. Yes. I think the word is yeah, something like the resultant of all the lift forces. Well, I'm sure there's lots of different uh, <laughs> definitions. You just have to learn it. You just have to learn it. Yeah. Right. Ooh. Right. So, angle of attack. So again, direction of travel is well opposite direction of airflow. So if you're flowing through the traveling through the air, you're generally all the same thing. The air is then basically direction is going into your face. And I'm going to add fast warning that'll be warning eight then for a normal as a paraglider. Uh, uh, B would be one of eight. Yes. Higher B might be one of nine. Yes. Are you usually the big number first, nine to one? Yes. Um, and then as you get into the C's and the D's, you're going to be going 10 and 11 to 1. Yes. And they just have better performance. The same, so, it's really the same. <clears throat> so the angle of attack is if you take your wing, you take your direction of air, air flow, or which is basically the opposite direction of your travel. You take your cord line, which is you have to draw a line from the very tip to the back of your paraglider right through the very center. It's the angle it makes there is your angle of attack. Now, as, as you pull the brakes, your angle of attack goes up. And as you put on speed bar, generally your angle of attack decreases. So that's where angle of attack is relevant. It's, 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 how, you, um, it's how you control the glider effectively is your angle of attack. You know, if you pull both brakes, the whole glider increases in angle of attack. If you pull one brake, one side, the angle of attack increases. That causes it to have more drag it slows down and the other part of the glider turns. So you actually turn into that direction. So angle of attack is how you control your wing. That's probably even more true for the two liners uh, with the toggles where you're <clears throat> directly controlling that angle of attack with the feet. For everybody else, we're on brakes. All right. So you're pulling the back of the wing down, mm. which is one form of drag. But in pulling the back of the wing down, you're then levering it up at the front as well. Mm. Any questions? Does it doesn't make sense, or am I going too fast? No, Makes sense. Okay. Which is why I'll be going to uh, rear riser steering with my next slider. Uh, what's your next slider going to be? I don't know, but I tell you what, I'm waiting to fly. Chris Fountain's new oh, yeah, the flow. two and a half liner mm. flow fusion. Mm. See, they have a two and a half liner rush six now. Really? Mm. The rush six is the two and a half liner of the Delta. So I wait till this evening back. This is to give an, an example, um, an idea of angle of attack and the airflow over an aerofoil as you increase or decrease your angle of attack. So, when, when you see this air, it's a wonder the things work. It is, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> kind of scary when you see it. Now I don't know how relevant this is. This is um, this is a, an actual rigid aerofoil that's in a wind tunnel with smoke. Yeah. But you know, it's, it's it's similar shape to our aerofoils. So this set of slides here, Stephen, is to show you how show you the air flowing over an aerofoil, and as you increase the angle of attack, what happens to that air? Uh, it becomes. Uh... Disturbed more turbulence. Yeah, so the air is obviously the red bit. Yeah. So as we increase our angle of attack, you can see it starts to get a little bit more turbulent here. A little bit more, a little bit more. And all of a sudden, it has detached. Yes, yes. And you're at your stall point. So 
this is what happens if you go, if you pull too much brakes and just hold them on. You get to this point here. So this is what they call detachment. <clears throat> here at the very beginning, where you're flying along very nicely, with a lovely streamlined flow there across your wing and all the forces, the lifting forces are working the way they're supposed to, and everybody's happy and we're driving around and everything's good. Um, but then what you get, if you increase the angle of attack too much, air wants to stick together. It has kind of viscosity. It wants to stay together and it wants to hang on to your wing. It wants to kind of hug your wing. But if you push it too much and push your angle of attack, it just can't. And it breaks away from your wing. Once it breaks away from the wing, you don't have that lift anymore at the front. You don't have that nice uh, increase or decrease in pressure in the, in the front. And your wing stops flying. And that's what happens here when you get up to the very top. You get to your stall point. And at your stall point, you just hit this detachment of air here. So as you can see, it's not rushing around here and trying to meet its mates at the back and going faster and generating a nice area of low pressure above the wing. It's just going, ah, can be bothered with all of this. Yes. And it's just floating around here and creating all sorts of turbulence and this just totally um, interferes with any lift potential of that air was. And it's not flying anymore. You get to this point, it's not. It's stalled. And just, that, go, just go one back. Yeah. Two, two, yeah. So you can see where you get that change in the feeling of your glider. <clears throat> in that, as your back end of the wing has, has already got that detachment of flow, you've got that mushiness. Mm. <clears throat> and, and you know, you could be putting more left and more right in, and it's doing nothing. So, so this there's is nothing. Nothing to act against. So one of the exercises you do if you do a sit, it's finding a stall point. Yes. Now what you'll do is you'll slow the wing down and slow the wing down. And the idea is that you learn uh, the feeling of your wing as it approaches the stall point. So that if it does happen in the wild, you get off the brakes yes. <laughs> and you let it fly. And, and what Peter's saying is, as you can see here, as you're approaching the stall point, you get a lot of turbulence back here. There's no... Uh, laminar flow back here. And this bit of the wing here is just going to be fluttering about. It'll have, even if you pull brakes, it's not going to do anything. It's got nothing to act against. Yeah. So you feel it as you, as you approach the stall point. You feel the back of your wing starting to be very mushy and very light and fluttery. And even if you start doing something to your brakes, it's not going to do anything. You know? So that's one of the things you do with a, a sieve is the search for stall. And the idea is to recognize the signs before you get there. Rather than now, the other thing you do in a sieve is uh, you learn what to do if you actually saw your wing and how to get it back flying again. But you're much better to recognize the signs before you stall it rather than recover from a stall if you can help it. So these are the um, characteristics of a stall high angle of attack. Uh, that causes, and the reason that I'm that that causes so it causes the separation of air, which just then creates huge massive turbulence within the wing. There's no lift at all on the top of your wing, none at all. Um, you have a lot of drag because now you've got this quite big um, profile pushing through the air, so you've got a lot more drag, no lift on top. It's all just working against it. The six loss of lift, and your center of pressure, which we'll talk about in a second. Your center pressure usually sits here, your center pressure to move way forward here, which means that your, your airfoil is actually being pushed further over. So you get to the point where not only have you stalled, but the wing wants you to stall naturally. It doesn't want to come back. And we talk about that when we get to stability. Any questions on angle of attack? Is there a point where, the, although the wing is uh, stalled, but it will parachute there? Yeah. Um, yeah, if you're really good and an acro pilot, you probably can keep it at that point, just at the right point. It would be a sweet spot, I guess. Mm. I wouldn't be able to do it. Mm. It's something I'd like to learn to do, but I don't have the sensitivity to do it. But yes. it is, it is, um, yeah. it's an acro move. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, a way you could simulate that is go out some day, ground handling, turn your wing upside down, and try to control it on the on the brakes. Uh, yeah. You'll find it's a lot harder than controlling it when it's right set up on the, um, mm -hmm. the right, a lot harder because mm -hmm. they're not designed to control the wing in that way. So, but that's what you're doing when you're going to be controlling the brakes. 
So let's talk about stability and the concept of stability. Well, obviously, if we're talking about is this little green P, is it in a stable scenario there? Well, it is. And the reason is if you move it, it'll tend to come back to the point you want it to be at. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, how would you put it? It comes back to the configuration you want it to be in. That's pretty stable. But even, even that stable um, configuration has a limit. I mean, if you push this key up over the top here, it can fall off the side here and it's not mm -hmm. stable anymore. But for the most part, it's quite stable. You can push it to the left and the right and it'll eventually work its way back into the center. So that's a very stable configuration. Now that's obviously a very unstable configuration. The slightest move of that P and then just keep going. It won't come back to the center. So that's unstable. And then you have something like this, which is quite neutral. I could move the P to there and it just stops. Mm -hmm. Doesn't come back or doesn't go anywhere. And similarly, I can move it here. And that's neutral. So let's talk about um, paragliders and the concept of stability of paragliders. So is an aerofoil ship stable or unstable? Is it naturally stable or naturally unstable? In other words, if it kind of gets out of shape, does it want to get back into shape naturally? Or does it want to even get into more trouble? Get it more shape. You think an aerofoil shape is stable? Okay. We'll just take the aerofoil shape. Oh, okay. Right. Oh. Ah, no. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that right? Okay. Right. So there are two points in a, an aerofoil that you, you can think of. You can have, <laughs> <laughs> Take <you down> away. <laughs> so you get the point of gravity, which you can think of gravity obviously is, is acting through the whole area, but you can think of there is a particular point in this area called where the gravity is acting through. A bit like point pressure. Mm -hmm. And gravity is always working downwards. And then you have the point of pressure. So it's an area foil, it's got lift. So the pressure generally, the point of pressure is generally. The net pressure is generally going like this. That is an aerofoil. And generally, they're in balance. They're kind of around about the same point in the aerofoil. Mm. So, as you can see, what's happening here is gravity is trying to pull it down through this point, and the center of pressure is trying to push it up. Mm. And they're kind of on the same point. So, at that point there, you could say that aerofoil is quite stable. It's happy enough. But what happens if you increase the angle of attack slightly? See what happens when you increase the angle of attack on an aerofoil. The center of gravity stays the same on the left, but the center of pressure moves forward. So now, what happens now? You've got an aerofoil there. You've got gravity trying to hold it down, but you've got pressure has moved forward it and it's trying to push it up. That wing is now going to want to keep going up, you know, because it's now it's out of balance. You got uh, you got the the force that wants to move it up is higher than the fulcrum on the. And the, and the gravity, so it's going to actually want to keep pushing it up. And it just gets worse as you increase your angle of attack. So an aerofoil shape is inherently unstable. In other words, if you knock it out of your uh, desired configuration, it won't naturally come back. And yet that's what we fly. We fly aerofoils. And we can, we, we can prove from experience that they are quite stable and that, you know, it rocks all around the sky, but it all seems to come back. You no, know, where it's above my head, nice number, and it's you know it's where you want to be. So definitely paragliders seem to be inherently stable, and yet the aerofoil above our heads is inherently unstable. And why is that? Uh -huh. Exactly. Exactly. So you got three axes. To talk about stability. So if, if you think of this as a paraglider, this is the front of the paraglider here. Uh, this is looking head on to a paraglider. So these are both sides. And this is looking down on top of the paraglider. So you have three axes of movement. You've got a pitch, which is a paraglider moving like this. You got a roll when it's going sideways. And your when it's kind of going like this. Um, and paragliders are designed to be stable in these three axes, more or less, depending. I mean, there's a whole compromise of, of characteristics. And you will find that as you go up through the more performant wings, you will make compromise in some areas. So they may be less stable in some areas in order to gain more performance. But generally, the, the main ingredient in creating the stability, you were right, is the pendulum effect. Because what you have is, 
think the power value looks like five kilos plus two, two kilos a line. And 90 kilos of the big fat lad underneath it. <laughs> Most of the weight in your in your um, aircraft is sitting way, way down here, a couple of meters below the aerofoil. You know, it's a significant amount of weight. So you got this pendulum effect, and it forces the aerofoil back to the configuration you want to be in, which is sitting above your head. So to give you an idea, if we say I take the pitch, if we pitch way back, right, what will happen is the wing pitches back. I keep flying forward, but now my weight is just going to go swing and right back underneath the wing. So I catch up with the wing, even though in this configuration here, the wing wants to keep going up and up. Yes. It just does. The airfoil itself doesn't want to come back. Yes. But it's constrained by these lines. Yeah. And as this, you know, 90 kilos or 100 kilos or whatever we are, starts to swing back, yeah. it brings it back. Yes. Right? It forces it back yes. into the shape we want it to be in. Yes. So the pendulum effect is what keeps a paraglider yes. stable above our heads. Yes. It's not the aerofoil. Yes. The aerofoil is working against us. Yes. Um, so that's the pendulum effect on pitch. So very similar on roll. So for instance, you're flying along, one half of your paraglider goes into quite a strong thermal and it's pitched up like that. And this wing pitches down again, the whole wing wants to keep going, but these lines don't allow it. And your weight eventually you'll, you'll, you'll roll up, and eventually you'll start coming back down. Mm -hmm. And you pull the wing back into the shape. Mm -hmm. So, again, pendulum. Now, the, the yaw is different, yaw is to do with the shape and the washout, or the sorry, the sweep back. So, I'll explain that. So, this is looking down on a paraglider. And we're looking at the stability. If I got a paraglider like this, and um, it doesn't generally turn like this so much, you'd, you'd be more yes. familiar with that, yeah. with the roll and the pitches. But you know, generally, especially the lower aspect ratio gliders don't give you a sense of this. The bigger, wider ones will, will do all sorts of funny. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's when both wingtips start going <laughs> yeah. forward, and they bend forward and back. Yeah, like but uh, <laughs> it, it's not a. Um, you don't notice the yaw as much in a paraglider, but it does yaw. Um, so, is a paraglider yaw stick? In other words, if it goes off your configuration, does it naturally want to come back or does it naturally want to keep turning? So, it's yaw stick. And the reason is it's what they call sweep back. So, if you notice with a paraglider, this is the leading edge here, it's kind of swept back here and it's swept back here. It's not a straight line right across there. There's a reason for that. Number of reasons, but one of them is it um, improves your yaw stability. So what happens is if the paraglider turns like that, keep in mind we're moving in that direction. So the airflow is coming like this. And for some reason, I'm flying through the air, and for some reason my paraglider goes like that. We present a bigger part of the wing to the airflow here than here. And this creates more drive. This part of the wing now creates more drag. And what it does is it forces that side of the wing back. There's less drag on this side of the wing than there is in here when it yaws. Now, the, the understanding is that the airflow is coming straight. Yes. Right. So that's why this is called sweep back. The sweep back shape gives you your stability. Yes. Is that clear? Yes. Right. Okay. So, have any of you flown any other kind of aircraft? <clears throat> Uh, the hang glider. Oh, uh, hang glider is actually better. I'll say it's just on the little, you know, the yes. lessons, you know. Because that, that, that's the big tops. Yeah. Than the new, right. The one big Absolutely. difference with a paraglider is, is that you, you take your hands off and it just writes itself. Yeah. <clears throat> Not many other aircraft do that. Mm, yes. if, you, if you're on a joystick aircraft, it mm. might come back from a roll, but it's going to take a long time to do it. You actually check it back from a roll and you do the yes. same with hang glider mm. as well. Mm. Now, one you're, of the reasons... So if you're unconscious on the paraglider, you're in a better position. Oh, much better position. Yeah. If you're unconscious, just one that legs. Yeah, much better position. Yeah. And the main reason is 
paragliders and aircraft. There are very few aircrafts where the aircraft itself is 95% the weight of the aircraft is sitting way, 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 way below. It's a very strong center of gravity. Mm -hmm. But even a helium balloon, the weight, the weight of a helium balloon yeah. is in the in, in the balloon. Yeah. You know, even, even if there's three or four guys sitting in the basket, I guarantee you the basket and the guys sitting in the basket are, are not as much as the weight of the material of the balloon. It's still a high center of gravity. Yeah. Whereas a paraglider, as an aircraft, has a unique configuration where it's got an extremely low center of gravity. And therefore, it will naturally, that, that's such a huge impact. We're sick of a hang glider. Hang glider is a little bit heavier than a paraglider. Um, and most of the weight of a hang glider is the person that's flying it generally. But they're an awful lot closer to the top. They're sitting way up here. Yeah. They're not sitting three meters below. You know, so the pendulum effect has there's no pendulum effect in that sense, or it's negligible. The hang glider, or the paraglider, it's this pendulum effect, which is brilliant because it's you're unconscious and your hands go up a paraglider. It will want to fly straight yes. and true and get your home on an XC. You probably fly your XSC. That'd be great. <laughs> but, so um, I suppose we could talk about pitch stability with the, the reflex shape. So what uh, you probably heard of the reflex um, airfoil shape. Yes. Um, it's, it, it's not relevant at all for free flight, but it is for paramotors. Uh, they use it quite a bit. Um, and what the re reflex is, is you have a wing, just like a wing. Is that the back of the wing? Too? Yes, it is. Now, keep in mind that really you can create reflex shapes with rigid wings. You can create to find reflex shapes with hang gliders because they're kind of semi rigid and they've got all kind of wires and patterns. You can't force the back of a wing on a paraglider, but it's a piece of material with a bit of wind in it. Unless you get some buttons in Correct. And then it becomes less and less of a paraglider and more of a hang glider. So it's called a reflex shape, but it's, it's kind of, it isn't really in a paraglider. But what they do is you have these what's called trimmers on your back lines. And they're, uh, they're a mechanism where you can make the line longer or shorter. So if you make it shorter, you pull the back down and you get a nice touch. So if you have the trimmers on, on a reflex wing, you pretty much have the normal airfoil shape. But if you shorten the lines and you kind of pull the, you pull the wing back into the shape. If you let the trimmers off, you loosen them, what you do is this. Basically, you loosen the back. So what happens? The back of your wing kind of just flutters around and does nothing. Now, it doesn't create a reflex shape. It flutters around the place, right? You're simulating a reflex shape, but it's not really a reflex shape, it's a rigid shape where you know you actually have this nice little curl up yes. you know? what you get on a paraglider is you get a floppy bit of uh, of material at the back that isn't doing anything if you look down on the paraglider from the top when you take the trimmers off effectively the last bit of your wing just becomes floppy bit of material and your wing if you notice has got effectively quite a bit smaller you've gone from maybe a standard size wing down into sort of a mini wing and um, what it does is one of the things it does is it changes the angle of attack because you've, you've let this up a bit. So now the wings kind of points a little bit like that. Mm -hmm. It moves the pressure of gravity, uh, pressure, point of pressure forward. It loads the front of the wing. So now all the weight that used to be on all of this wing is now on a much smaller piece. Mm -hmm. So there's much more pressure in that wing, much more loading on it. It feels really steady and, and, and stable above your head. Um, it lets you go faster, mm. but if it goes, it's going to go big. <laughs> it's going to go big because literally you have gone from possibly an E and B, which is this wing here, to an uncertified wing, which the trimmer's on. In fact, I don't think there's any reflex wing that's certified with the trimmer's on. Mm. I don't think there is. I think you effectively have changed characteristics of your wing. But the advantages it gives you is a much more stable profile. And you can you go faster because you have a smaller wing and your angle of attack is increased. So that's why they use it on paramotors because paramotors have a great big 
motor on your back that kind of you're normally in a paraglider, you're flying along here and then we spoke your head with a power motor. You're kind of flying always up a hill a bit. Yes. And you want the wing to come forward a little bit and have more penetration, not to be always with this high angle up there. You want it to. So you, you'll find our reflex wings um, are used a lot with power motors. But what isn't really advertised is that you're going from possibly a nice ENB certified wing. You put the Put the trimmers off, you go to an uncertified way. It has advantages, but it has disadvantages. So that's reflex. So let's talk about wash in and wash out. And wash in is more what we're interested in the party. Do you want to take a break? Or will I keep going? We're halfway. Yeah, we're about halfway. Let me see, by the way. Uh, give me another two or three slides, and then we'll be halfway. Twenty slides will be halfway. Yeah, two more slides. Eight, eight um, okay, I'm Sorry, gonna, I want to go a bit faster. Will I? Okay. So wash in. Think of this top slide here. This is the center of the wing, the big one, and and this is looking at the wing from the side. And this is the edge or the tip of the wing. So wash in is where your tip of the wing has a higher angle of attack. It's the, it's it's designed into the wing. So what you find is if you look at your wing as you're moving out towards the tip, it might start like that and it slowly starts having an angle of attack to side. So at the front it might be like that, and then out of the wing it's right. That's called um, washing, right? And that has various characteristics associated with it. And that's what we've got. So You'll find that paragliders have washing because it suits a paraglider. Uh, washout has other, washout is the opposite where the tip actually has a lower angle of attack. And that has other benefits, uh, advantages and disadvantages. It doesn't really apply to us, and we're not going to go into it in the, um, I don't think we need to go into it in this uh, thing. So if you take a paraglider, paraglider has washing. If you look at your paraglider, above your head, it'll have a certain angle of attack, but the tips, it goes out of this, but then the tips have much more angle of attack than the center of your wing. Now, that has two advantages and one disadvantage, which is really an advantage. One of them is because the tips, when you're flying normal, your normal flight, uh, because the tips have a higher angle of attack, they have, more, <coughs> they're generating more lift. And therefore, they're generally trying to lift themselves up. So it, it keeps the pressure, span wise pressure in the, in the wing. It kind of keeps the two wing tips trying to spread themselves up. So, Wash in, generates. So the lift, the lift creates the yeah. result. Yeah. Because, the tips. because as generally um, your, your wing isn't trimmed so that you get maximum <coughs> lift at trim. There's usually a little bit, you know, as you increase your angle of attack, you get a little bit more lift. Yes. But you might get more drag with it, but you get a little bit more lift. Yes. So what you have is because there's um, more, a higher angle of attack at tips. They're generating a little bit more lift yes. than the center part of the wing. Yes. And because the paraglider is a circle, that lift is pointing out in that direction. So, in other words, it kind of yes. just nudging the wings out a little bit more. Yes. So, it gives you a nice stable arc. So, washing is an advantage for a paraglider. Yes. It's right. a stable arc. Yeah, it, it kind of wants the wing to. Thing. Yes. Uh, the disadvantage is if you go to a higher angle of attack, you'll keep in mind that your wing tips are even more, they will tend to stall first. So as you go up to your stall point, your wings are the things that are going to stall first, mm -hmm. and then the center. Now that's a good thing in a paraglider as well, because you want the center to stay flying, because the wing tips can give you a little signal going, oh, oh you're getting close to the stall point, maybe you should stop, <laughs> let the brakes off. And you start flying again. So that's one of the characteristics that's of the wash. Yeah. You get that kind of arc in the end. Yeah. As they're falling. Yeah. Because the top is still coming. Kind of well, well, no, at that point when they're falling, they're completely solid. The whole wing is solid. Right. This is when you're approaching soil point. What you'll find is if you approach it slowly, your wingtips are starting to get fluttery. Right. And if you look at them, they're kind of fluttering around a bit. But the center of your wing is still flying, right. barely, but still flying. That's because there's just a little bit more angle of attack in the wing tips. And that's the kind of thing that you'll start to 
learn to, to judge and to feel, and you go, oh, well, okay, I'm getting close to my stall point. Let the brakes off. Don't be warning. Hmm? Uh, when you are very near a stall, the wheel spins because it one wing tip will go before the other. Mm. Right. And that <laughs> translates yeah. into a spin very, very quickly. Mm. And the higher performance wings will react quicker and they're going to spin even quicker. But right. you've got a murder eye on, haven't you? No. A U turn. That is yeah. um, particularly with the ions. No. You, you might see this with a U turn as well. But you can see in the first third of the wing as a band. Quite a noticeable bank that goes across the first third of Steve's wing. Uh, and that uh, is a band that takes advantage of that spiralized tension from the, from the uh, wingtips having a higher angle of attack. Mm. Oh, and it's kind of stretches that yeah. going out a bit. Um, all right, I'll just go through the stability. There's only two more slides. One is your stability. We've been through it already. Why does your why does the um, sweep back? provide your stability is because uh, paragliders and hang gliders generally have this shape. Paraglider is not as obvious unless you look down on it, mm. but a hang glider is obvious. And the reason is if you yaw, you present more uh, surface to the oncoming wind, it creates more drag and it forces that side back. Less drag here, so it's not forced back as much. So basically it tends to go back into the shape you want it to be in and that's giving you um, stability. And then you got roll stability. I don't think we need to talk about dihedral and anhedral. So, okay. We're going to talk about drag now. And there's two types of drags we're interested in. Induced drag, which has very interesting definition there. Drag caused by the generation of lift. And parasitic drag, which is everything else. So, Induced drag, this is where we have our wingtip vortices and stuff like that. Um, so what happens when you're flying through the air, we went through it before with the aerofoil, that there is a, a high pressure, sorry, a high pressure underneath and a low pressure above the wing. So what happens when the air from the underneath and the air from the top meets? Well, obviously there's a high pressure underneath the wing. So once the air, the high pressure air, at the back gets to the back of the wing. It's going to want to shoot up, shoot up over the top of the wing because it's high pressure underneath and low pressure above. So what, what's going to happen is if is as you flow through the air, the air goes to the back of the wing and then it goes phew, and release and it shoots up like this. Because you move through the air at the same time, it ends up creating these curves. And that's happening all the way along your trailing edge. But where it's really, really noticeable is here on the tips. And um, because you have more than just one edge coming together, you've got a front and a back and a side and everything. And this is this is the, the, the biggest part of your induced drag is the drag caused by the tips of your glider. Right? And literally it creates a vortex like that. And it flows off behind your glider on both sides. Yes. And that's why you has to large. Aspect ratio yeah, yeah, partly because they have a shorter cord, um, and because they're longer, apparently it reduces this. Yes. So, um, and that's your induced strike. Your induced strike is these vortices. So it's the, the big vortices at your wing tips and the, the little vortices that are at the back of your wing. Yeah. That's your induced strike in paragliding. As you move through the air. The fact that you're creating lift, you're creating lift because you're creating this pressure differential between what's underneath your wing and above your wing. So when the air does clear your wing, it's going to naturally want to just mix all the game like this into these um, vortices. That's your induced lift. Um, it's highest when you're slow, and as you go faster, it reduces. And if you could go infinitely fast, it would reduce to zero. But you can't go infinitely fast. But if you could, if you could keep speeding up. Your induced drag would eventually get to zero at infinity. There is an example of some induced drag. Huh? That's pretty big. You wouldn't want to be caught in the back here. And it's not a big aircraft. No, it's um, induced drag is created. Definitely size makes a difference. Um, weight makes a difference. 
Uh, it's higher when you're slow, so like a jumbo jet taking off with a huge huge strike. Whereas tiny little airplane flying up at three thousand feet at whatever Mach two or three will be very little. It's in two strikes. So it goes up with wing loading. Wing loading, right? So which is why tandem wings. You get flying behind a tandem wing, you can get quite a uh, uh, bit of turbulence. Now. And you, you get bumped around a bit. So if there's a tandem floating around the sky, give it a little bit more space and you're flying behind it. Whereas it's, it's creating much bigger. Is there, right. is there more turbulence behind the wing tips as opposed to directly behind the wing? Yeah. The biggest bit of turbulence is here on the tips. So if, I, if somebody's in front of me, as it were, put it there and I'm here, I'm going to explain even more. Turbulence here, and then I'm going to directly behind them. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah, but, but keep in mind, if you're directly behind them, you're probably directly behind their body, which is creating turbulence as well. <laughs> you know, so it probably isn't that significant the difference. But from the airfoil point of view, the biggest turbulence comes off the tip. Yes, yes. Um, I have a picture here later on showing you turbulence. So parasitic drag, there's three types of parasitic drag. So induced drag is the drag that's created by you your mechanism of generating lift. In yes. other words, it's a fact that you create a high pressure underneath your wing and a low pressure above your wing. That creates induced drag. That creates these little twirls in there. Yes. But there's other forms of drag, such as what we call form drag. It's just the fact yes. that I'm pulling this shape through the air. So if you had a big flat um, bar like that, it creates a lot of drag. If you try to streamline it a bit and make it a nice little sphere, well, you reduced your drag by about 50% there just by changing it to a sphere. And if you go down to a nice teardrop, well, you reduced it by 95% compared to this just the brute force pulling in that far through the air. So that's form drag, and it's just your shape, which is why if you want to travel fast and speed bar, pull your hands in, you know, get a nice straight shape like this. You want to have a nice streamlined um, cockpit and, and uh, harness and everything to reduce your form drag. The drag that your shape is causing to you. So the other one is skin friction, and that's just um, it's it's the way the air kind of sticks to the material as it goes over. Right? And as the air flows over your airfoil, it will interact with the material. There'll be little imperfections in the material, and there's all the threads and the and, and the seams and everything, and that causes the air kind of holds on to the air. It's kind of that friction, so that creates skin friction. And that can be counteracted by having much cleaner lines, uh, the materials you use, the coatings you put on the material, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And then finally, you have what they call interference drag. Now, this is more relevant in aeroplanes than in um, paragliders, but it also has uh, an impact to us. Now, this is where you have two different airflows bumping into each other because of the shape. So if you take an airplane there, as that's flying through the air, it's forcing the air at the front, it's forcing the body of air to push up this side. But there's also air being pushed over from this side. And those two bodies of air are just going to bump into each other, create all sorts of turbulence and turbulence generates strike. Turbulence strike. strike. So this is called interference strike. And it's drag caused by uh, your shape causes the air to kind of bump into each other. Into the side. And uh, interference drag is higher when you have acute angles like this. So these here are going to create more interference drag than this angle here, for instance, isn't as acute. Okay. So those are the three forms of parasitic drag. And the ones that, um, it's the, the biggest one we have is definitely the form drag is, is the biggest form of parasitic drag for us. This would be the second one, in friction with the aerofoil. So how do they work? Because parasitic drag increases as you go faster. Induced drag decreases as you go faster. So it makes sense there's going to be a sweet point somewhere. And, and if you graph them, so your parasitic drag is, you have no parasitic drag when you're not moving through the air. As you move through the air and get faster and faster and faster, it just gets more and more and more and more and more. And this is one of the reasons why you have the constant maximum speed. Because it just gets more and more and more and more and more. 
eventually you can't go on your answer as you drag. Look, it's not even a straight line, it's logarithmic. It's heading up there. Your induced drag has the opposite effect. It starts really high. So when you're traveling through the air very slowly, you create great big vortices. You get a lot of induced drag when you're moving slowly. So I said it's your greatest induced drag is when you're slow. Off. Correct. Yes. Correct. Yes. On your runway. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. 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 Uh, but as you get faster and faster and faster, it decreases. And there will be a point where both these graphs, um, your total drag, obviously, is you add your parasitic drag and your, and your induced drag. Add them together and you get a number. So that's my total drag. Yes. So it's all me back. Yes. And your minimum drag is only at the point where these two graphs meet. Right? And that is going to correspond Here's your total drag, you can add them together, right? add that number and that number together, you get to that. Right? So your total drag will have this shape, like the big extended U. And at this point here, the lowest point, that's where you have the least amount of drag. And strangely enough, that corresponds with your best glide. Best glide. Best glide means best glide angle. Yes. So whatever speed that is for your, your um, uh, your paraglider, yes. and of course, this uh, these change in, in uh, the changes with the uh, air. But if you're in still air, there will be a speed that you fly that gives you the best flight. Yes, in still air. Yes. In other words, you will fly the furthest. Yes. Right. And it's no surprise that it coincides with the point that you're least fly. It's the speed that you're least fly. Yeah. That's what your best flight is. It's the point. That you have least total drag. Make sense? Yeah. So let's talk about air speed versus ground speed. Any questions on drag? Uh, yes. Uh, what happens at the lowest sink rate? Uh, we'll go into that later. Um, I've got that. So we will, yeah, we'll talk about that later. I'll, I'll show the polar curve and we can talk about it then. Um, but any questions about drag itself? Okay. Right, so let's talk about airspeed versus ground speed. So ground speed, we're, we're all, we know ground speed is. Ground speed is, is what we generally think of speed. It's how fast we're moving over the ground. And if you're driving a car and driving at 60 miles an hour, that's my ground speed. I'm driving over the ground, I'm moving over the ground at 60 miles an hour. Now, in still air, in other words, the air isn't moving at all. So we're, we're flying in this body of air here and it's completely still. If we're moving at 10 kilometers an hour over the ground, well, we're also moving through the air. Now, when they talk about airspeed, what they mean is how fast is the air flowing over my wing? Which is opposite to the direction you're traveling. So if I'm traveling in that direction, actually, I've got my arrow wrong. My airspeed is actually, it's the wing going over. It's the air coming into my face. Yeah. Airspeed is how fast is the air flowing over your wing? Yes. So if I'm moving in that direction, the air is moving over my wing in this direction. Yes. In still air, if I'm moving over the ground at 10 kilometers an hour, in other words, my ground speed is 10 kilometers an hour, my air speed is 10 kilometers an hour. Still air. Yeah. But you're, you're descending, so your actual distance you're moving is... Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's further. No, that, so that, that, that has nothing to do with... It doesn't matter if I'm going up. I'm going down and I'm going sideways. Yes. How fast is the air flowing over my wing? Yeah. That's my air speed. And in still air, it's exactly the same as my ground speed. So what happens if we've got a tailwind? Right? So effectively, we're flying in a big body of air that's moving along over the ground at five kilometers an hour. Right? We, may, we would still be moving through this body of air at 10 kilometers an hour. Or Moving along there, 10 kilometers an hour. But from somebody standing on the ground, we're now moving over the ground at 10 kilometers an hour, plus the fact that this whole body of air is moving forward at five. We're moving over the ground at 15 kilometers an hour. So our ground speed is our air speed plus the wind. And if it's a tailwind, it's actually moving us faster. So do you understand the difference between ground speed and air speed? Yes. Right. And, and similarly, if you have a headwind, 
Well, it just slows your ground speed. Your airspeed remains the same. I'm still flowing through this massive air here at 10 kilometers an hour. But this whole body of air is moving this way at five kilometers an hour. So my ground speed is not on five. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's the difference between airspeed and ground speed. And it's important. Um, it becomes really important when you're coming into land. The reason is uh, you need airspeed to fly. You need the air flowing over your wing to generate lift. You don't need ground speed to fly. You need airspeed. Air speed. Right? You don't need ground speed. For instance, you could be in a wind tunnel, completely stationary. But because they're blowing air over your wing, you may be flying in that wind tunnel, but you have zero ground speed. So you don't need any ground speed to fly. You need airspeed. And that's important. Um, that can become quite important when you're coming into land and you may be coming into land into a headwind or, for instance, a tailwind. And you're coming into land. And as you're coming into the ground, you seem to be getting faster and faster and faster over the ground. And you start slowing, slowing, slowing down. Because <laughs> I don't want to go so fast over the ground. But then you get so slow that you're not actually flowing through, flying through the air at all. You, you've killed your airspeed. And you stop and you, you fall out of the air. You hurt yourself. So this is, this is the important um, speed for pardon me, airspeed. You have to keep the air flowing over your wing. You need airspeed to fly. You don't need ground speed to fly. Now, they're usually quite related. They're usually but You need airspeed, not ground speed. Right, so any questions about airspeed, ground speed? The difference between airspeed and ground speed. Okay, so let's talk about the polar curve. You'll definitely be asked a couple of um, questions, at least one on the polar curve. So you need to study it because um, it's not obvious. It's one of these things. It's a graph. You just have to learn to use it. So what a polar curve is is you create your two axes. So this is your sink rate or your lift rate. So if I'm sinking from down here, lift rate. And this is your airspeed, left or right. So if I'm going faster, I'm moving up this graph. And then what you do is you go into perfectly still air and you fly at different speeds and you graph your scene. Right? So somebody's gone out one day with lots of equipment on their deck and they've flown around in a beautiful still morning and they kind of slower, 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 and they check, okay, how, how much am I sinking now? Oh, I'm sinking that much, I'm sinking two meters a second. Okay, there's my, if, I'm, if I go at that speed, I sink two meters per second. If I go at this speed, I sink at 1.5 meters per second. If I go at this speed, I sink at this. And you end up getting a graph that generally always looks like this, always, right? It has a drop-off point here where you stall. So I'm pointing graph down here because you're stalling over the air, so you're stalling over the air. And generally, it looks like that. Some wings, it'll be more pronounced. Some wings might be a little bit flatter, but they always look like this. Okay. And this graph can tell you some things. So that's your stall point. It's always there. It's always the end of the graph. Yes. You can't graph beyond this because you stall. It's like you got a straight line down. Correct. That is your stall point. point. Yeah. So the very tip of your graph there is your main sink. Because literally, that is what it is. If you work it over onto your sink axis, it's the point on your graph, on your line, that you have the minimum sink. That's your min sink point. So whatever speed that was, that's your min sink for your wing. And that's the speed. If you fly at that speed, you have the minimum sink. And then the one that you're probably more interested in is your best glide, which is what gives me furthest distance that I could possibly go of my best line. And the way you get your best line in still air is you draw a line from this point here. Uh, you draw a tangent to your curve. And just where it touches your curve, that's your best line. I work that up there and you go, that's the speed I need to fly at to be at my best line. And generally, that is the pattern you see. You find your stall is on the left. Your min sink is in the middle. Your best slide is a little bit to the right. Um, I believe modern wings, these two points are getting closer. Older wings, they were wider apart. It's just design and, and stuff like that. 
well, um, that's the, but generally that's the pattern you get to install in the same investment. Okay, so you can use this polar curve then to work out, this is the one you're really interested in using, my best slide, I want to find, what's my best slide? It's my best slide in Sierra. And you could go up there and this could say, let's say 36 kilometers an hour, I go, fine. In Sierra, I'm going to apply 36 kilometers an hour, because that can give me the best slide, I can get the furthest. What if there's a tailwind or a headwind, or you're in sink or lift? What do you do then? Do you still fly at 36 kilometers an hour? Well, let's talk about headwind and tailwind. So, just showing you, this is the same graph. This is what my best slide was in still air. So you take a tangent from the point there, and you just draw it so that it just touches your curve. The point, it just touches the curve. Come up to here, and that gives you the speed for your best one. Let's say you have a tailwind. Now, if you have a tailwind, this is your airspeed. What's going to happen to your airspeed? You're going to go faster. So the wind pushing you. The way you work this um, polar curve with the tailwind is you start the point of your line further to the left. So let's say you had a tailwind of, I don't know, I'd say these are tens. So let's say you had a tailwind of 20 kilometers an hour. You actually draw your line to your curve from the, 20, the minus 20 point. This is what you just have to learn. It's, if you have a tailwind, you move to the left. And you start your point from there, and you draw again a tangent to where you just touch your curve, your, um, sorry, your, your curve. What you will find is, in a tailwind, your best line is a little bit slower. Because it'll, it'll be to the left of where it was in um, still air. Yes. So what's that telling you? If you've got a tailwind and you want to maximize your glide, you slow down a little. Yeah. Not a lot. Don't slow down so that you get to the stall. <laughs> but a little. If you slow down a little with a tailwind, you maximize your glide. That's what this is showing you. Okay. So is that what you guys are doing if, uh, say if you're on the ridge and it's slightly to one side, here's the ridge. And I'm on my glider, and the wind is coming from there. When you are flying, are you flying uh, faster? As it were, slightly into wind. Generally, into wind, I'll be on bar. Um, but I don't really slow down when I've got a tailwind. I can just fly around. It might be on bar because I just want to go somewhere else. But so it's just slightly off. It slightly has a bigger off, impact you will, on wind. You will tend to put your uh, speed bar on. Mm, mm, it, it, you have. It's, it's more significant with a headwind yes. to fly faster than yes. with a tailwind. Look, there isn't really a lot of difference. Yeah. Obviously, on, on the hill, you're not you won't be flying into him. Let's talk about a headwind. Yeah. yeah. Right? I've now gone to a 20 kilometer an hour headwind. Yes. I've done the same thing. I've started from my point there. I've done a tangent to the curve. Where it touches the curve, I've raised my arrow. That's my best slide with a headwind. In other words, wind in my face. Yeah. In other words, it's telling me you got to speed up. And you will generally find this pattern where there's a more significant benefit to flying faster in the headwind than there is to flying slower in the tailwind. Because the tailwind, there isn't much difference really between the speeds, yeah. your best slide speed. But look at the difference here. Your best slide is way out here. Yeah. In other words, it's telling you if you got wind in your face, get on the speed bar. That's, that's what this is telling you. And this, if you've drawn this curve, Precisely, which generally you can't get it precise. But if you could, this would not only tell you to go faster, it would tell you what speed you should fly at. Or for a 20 kilometer an hour headwind, you should fly at whatever that is 30, 40, 45 kilometers an hour. For a 20 kilometer an hour tailwind, you should be flying at 34 kilometers an hour to maximize your blackness. It's a similar thing for if you're in lift and in sync. Uh, if you're in sinking air, move up the graph and start your point. And if you're in rising air, move down the graph and start your point. And what you're going to find is if you're in sink, speed up. If you're in lift, slow down. If you've got a headwind, speed up. If you've got a tailwind, slow down. 
but significantly it's with the headwind in the sink. That's where you get the biggest benefit of getting your speed right. Yes. If you got a headwind or you're in sync, get on the bar mm. because it, you get a much bigger increase in your best line. Yes, more significant than that. Um, but quite often it's just full bar. Yeah, yeah. Give it all you have. We don't speed up a lot, do we? Not like we go from mm -hmm. 20 miles to an hour to 100. Yeah, and I'll, I'll show you later on, I'll show you an example of how that actually works. So this is just putting all of these um, two graphs together. Your best glide in a headwind or sinking gear is faster than your normal speed. Yes. And your best glide in a tailwind or rising gear is a little bit slower, but if you don't go slower, it's not gonna make a significant difference. But this will. You guys ever get a question about this one? You're in the sinking air and you've got a headwind. Yep. And you do that more. Sure, yeah. Just to create a box. What about this one here? So, question best glide, still air. How do you get your best glide speed in still air? From the cross point, from the knot. The knot. Exactly. You just draw a tangent and you go there and it says boom, boom. Oh, right, and it's roughly 35 kilometers now in this chart. Okay. Next one. Headwind of 20 kilometers an hour. It's a headwind where you go from the 20s, it goes to the right. Yeah, you go to the right. Yeah, you go to 20. Think of it as, think of it as if you're, imagine you're facing that way, a headwind yes. is coming yes. from here. So you move towards your headwind. So you'll have to find your own mnemonic, what it is to decide, do I move left or right or up or down? Are your um, digits right on the Y axis? Ah! It doesn't matter. Hey, it's just numbers. It's just numbers to, to explain a concept. Yeah. So, um, so headwind, dum -dum, you find your best life is faster. Now you're up at about 45. Before we're at 35, now we're at 45. Right, so... Aha! I use that. Yeah, no, no. What are you going to do? Where are you going to start your line, your tangent line? You got a headwind, so you want to come out this axis. Yes. But you're in sync, so you also want to go up. Yeah. So you go, I got a headwind of 20. I got sync of two. Where did it join? That's my start point for me. Yeah. There you go. And it finds that it's uh, quite fast. It's three kilometers an hour. You probably, with, with your wings, probably won't be able to reach that near. Um, Pete might. And mine might. Yeah. So uh, you just. You do the same. You have, have some ballast. <laughs> ballast, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So you just have to learn how to use the polar curve. You're not going to learn it here in this presentation. This just give you an idea. Yes. Yeah, you have to figure out. I, I find I can never remember should I go left or right or up or down. Okay. So polar curve. Right. One last thing. What happens when you add weight? What happens when you ballast up? You go faster. Yes, you do. Well, what happens to your polar curve? Effectively, what happens with your polar curve is you move it down, down this down direction, into, oh, down into the right. Yeah. So if you put some weight on, this is what happens. Your curve moves down. It's generally the same curve, right, okay. it just moves down. Yeah, okay. And then if you work out your three points again, they've all moved to the right. Yes. Your stall point is higher, yes. but also your mincing and your best line are all higher. Yes. Everything just moves forward. Yes, that's pretty much it. And you're also sinking a bit more, you can see, kind of lower on the, on the sink rate. Thing. But your glide angle is still the same. Your glide angle is pretty much the same, and you can think of it as your, your graph kind of just moves down this line. Yes. The, the one you're going to be asked for. What happens when you put weight? What happens to your stall speed when you put weight in the glider? It increases. Okay. No weight, weight. No weight, weight. Yes. All right, so that's just something you need to be careful if you ballast up. 
You can't fly as slowly as you might be used to. Okay, right. Let's talk about a couple of examples. This is nil wind. So here we are, I'm, I'm at a thousand meters, a kilometer up, still air, no thermals, absolutely nothing. I'm on my final glide, coming in, six o'clock in the evening, I've had a brilliant XC, come over the Humber. I have a straight glide home. If I go at min sink, interestingly enough, that won't get me further than my trim speed. Now, why am I saying that? Is that correct? I think that trim speed is should be best trim line. Speed is best my best line, my trim speed is best, best, line. best line. This is the best line, yes. isn't it? Yes. Right, min sync is, if you look at these numbers here, min sync is where you have the least, the lowest vertical uh, sync rate. So on my min sync, which in, on this hypothetical glider at 32 kilometers an hour, which is, you know, let's say my trim speed is 38, I've got a bit of break on. I'm only sinking at 1.05 meters a second. That's my minimum sink of those three. But because I'm not moving forward as fast as on the other two, I don't actually, by the time I hit the ground, I don't actually get the furthest. Although I have the min sink, I don't get the best slide. Whereas this trim speed, which has to be close to my best slide, trim speed, I have a little bit more sink, but I'm traveling horizontally over the ground a little bit faster, almost uh, two meters a second. Pattern. I've made these numbers up to make this look right. But this is generally the pattern of the glider. On a panic line, this trim speed, just your, your hands. Yep. No breaks. That's what it's trimmed at. Yeah. Yep. And modern paragliders, trim speed and best glider are pretty much the same. Yes. On older paragliders, they wouldn't. Yes. But on modern gliders, generally, uh, they recommend it just be fine around. Hands up for best glider. Um, if I put on speed bar, although speed bar gives me a much faster horizontal distance, I'm moving over the ground much faster. I've also increased my sink rate quite a bit. And by the way, these, these points do work out here exactly for these. So what happens is if, if I go from um, a kilometer up with speed bar, I actually don't quite get as far as if I was at mid sink or at trim speed. Trim speed gets me nine kilometers. Speed bar gets me 7.4. So I'd actually go an extra kilometer just by keeping my hands up yeah. and sit up. Right. So uh, this dotted line here is my trim speed at nil wind. Think of trim speed as my best slide. Yes. Right. So I've now got a tailwind, I've got wind behind me. Yes. Things are a little bit different. Speed bar still is the shortest of the two by a good bit. My trim speed and my min sync now are pretty much the same. Yeah, yeah, and if you go the other way, I've got a headwind of 20 kilometers an hour, roughly. Uh, 3.5, I must have been very uh, precise. Oil off. <laughs> I remember working all these numbers out to get this pattern here. So, what you have in a, in a headwind again, thousand meters, I've got a headwind, and these are the numbers of my wing. If I stick on speed bar, I will get the furthest. Not by a huge amount, only a little bit. Yes. There's less of a difference there generally, the headwind, than there. Ah. Ah. My numbers is four kilometers. Now, of course, these are fictitious numbers that I made to made up. Whereas there isn't a huge separation here. But the reason is anyway, you have less space. You less space to actually um, differentiate here. So you have to, here you've gone further. So, so your exaggerations are, are your, your distances are, are stretched out. The further you go, the bigger difference there will be in, in how far apart these lines are as well. So, what do you do? Take away from that. If you got a headwind or if you're in sync, get on that. If you got a tailwind, or you're rising in rising air, just go down a little. Not too much, a little. Right. That's pretty much what uh, I think we need to take out of that. And then your three different types of variometers, you might be asked for them. So you have a basic barrier, which just tells you, am I going up or down in the air? It doesn't tell you anything about the air mass you're flowing in. Right, then you have a total energy barrier. Now that's a little bit different. That tells you 
it, it makes a calculation not only of whether you're going up or down, but also your forward movement. Now that becomes relevant, for instance, um, if I'm flying along like this and I hit some uh, rising air, I'd like to, and, and obviously I start rising, but that's a good thing. Yes. I could lift. If, on the other hand, I'm doing something like this, I'm pulling my brake and I'm starting to do pendulum, right? As I'm penduluming forward, I'm rising, <laughs> but I'm not really gaining anything there, right? So um, a basic vario on both instances will tell me, oh, you're going up, good thing, yes, yes. right? Whereas a total energy vario will be able to tell the difference yeah. because it'll notice with my pendulum effect that when I've, I've increased my speed, yes. and although I am rising, I've also increased my speed um, and therefore say, well, actually, you're not really getting an FDM at all. Yes. You know? Or maybe you decrease your speed, I can't remember. This. But anyway, it'll tell you the difference between those two scenarios. The very to get this in a paraglider always happens is if you come off a speed bar because you heard a blip. So you just got a little blip and you thought, oh, there's going to be some rising air around here. You come off speed bar. And funnily enough, that, that beeping continues. Because yeah. <laughs> the wind drops back. You've just come off speed bar, you've slowed down, that's converted to extra height. Mm. Yeah. Um, so you think, sorted. Yeah. I sorted. hit something. I it's just a big. It's big. <laughs> um, the various we fly are of this type. I don't think they're talking energy there. And so you can start to put in total energy um, with a newer style of paragliding variables because you've got the three or the six axis inertial measurements. All right. Okay, I didn't know that. Like your phone's got. Okay. Uh, so yes, you can do that. There's not a great tradition of doing that. Because yeah. we, we just you just know we don't have the speed range to in, in, a, in a sailplane, yeah, it, it was a big technical thing that mm. needed to be sorted. But in a paraglider, it's just less of an issue. I mean, yeah. like I said, the only time you properly get it is yeah. you come off a speed bar because you heard a blip. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you get caught up by that once or twice, and then you know. And then you know. Then yeah. you know, yeah. So then the, the third uh, type of vario, again, has nothing to do with us. Um, it's what's called an air mass vario. So that will tell you also about the vertical movement of the air you're in. So it's, it's the whole body of air I'm in moving up or down. Yes. Um, and that is it.